Hey everybody, Greg Pruitt here with the Idaho Dispatch, and we are continuing our efforts to interview as many statewide candidates as possible. And so today I am joined by Miss Ash Ashley Jackson, a Republican gubernatorial candidate. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Well, we appreciate you taking time to sit down and do this interview, and we hope that you know, voters can get to know a little bit more about you in the process. Yeah, for sure. It's nice to be recognized that I am on the ballot, right? And there's been some interesting, controversial things. So okay. I appreciate you taking the time to get to know me. Yeah, no problem. So the first question I usually have for, for people who are running for office, especially statewide office, and really especially for governor, is how did you come to the decision of running for governor? Because, you know, it's not like, hey, I'm going to go run for my local city council, but I'm going to go for the top spot in the entire state, right? I mean, that's a big decision that you have to make with you, with maybe your family members or friends and talking to them. So what kind of ultimately drove you to run for governor and why governor? Well, that's a great question. In 2018, I almost ran for governor. I could see that our state was struggling with some freedom issues and specifically things I just didn't agree with. And I thought Raul Labrador would win in 2018, but when Tommy Alquist ran and he split the vote off right into three sections, Brad Little won. And so I've watched that relationship with he and the Lieutenant Governor over the last four years. And I'm just highly unimpressed. <laughs> and I say that from a leadership standpoint, I've traveled all over the world and I've taught leadership to kids. I care about a role model in our society and to me a governor is the champion of the people and so when 2022 rolled around and I could clearly see that there had been bickering going on for quite some time I was ready to step in and be a candidate from the people and as cliche as it sounds for the people that's where I'm at I am 36 years old I'm from Preston Idaho born and raised in Idaho okay so uh, I guess uh, before we kind of get more into the issues you talked about uh, Dr. Alquist had split the vote and, and Governor Little, I think, ended up winning with somewhere around 37 percent of the vote at that time. Uh, what would you say to those who say, well, wait a minute here. Now there's I think there's eight people on the ballot total. You were one of those. Could you potentially split the vote and give the help give a victory to Governor Little? Or do you think that you can pull off defeating all the other candidates in that process? That's a great question, too. I have written down the names of the candidates several times and right there's four major GOP supported candidates right Brad Janice Ed and Steve and those people will split the GOP vote really hard my platform of cannabis something that I'm really passionate about that's a freedom issue to me that has drawn a big crowd from the conservative base and also from a more a less conservative base right and so I expect to pull a hard percentage of the vote what that looks like I'll leave that up to the people and we'll find out on May 18th <laughs> okay okay so let's I guess let's jump into some of the issues and and maybe this is where you stick out differently than a lot of the other candidates in the race is that you are a very pro cannabis uh, candidate. So can you kind of talk about why that's a major part of what you are looking to do as governor of Idaho? Yeah, so <clears throat> Let's start. I was raised. Uh, I was raised Mormon from Preston, Idaho, and I appreciate faith. And I have a great relationship with my Creator, whatever that looks like to you. And so, as I grew up, I graduated from high school and I went to college at Treasure Valley. I got a scholarship. Uh, mm -hmm. I played volleyball, and I was in involved in. Um, academics there in such a way where I started consulting for companies and I saw my life take a turn into more of a vocational training and so I had a lot of hands-on experience while I was there and I started traveling the United States more and what I realized is as I traveled um, I, I would run into situations where people were using an alternative form of medicine. I was raised in the Western medicine industry. Um, in fact, my grandfather started the Budge Clinic in Logan, Utah, right? my mom is from a line of budges out of Logan so I believed in Western medicine with all my heart but one day I got E. coli I was 26 years old and I couldn't get better I knew something was wrong internally with my body but every medical doctor I went to said that it might be in your head so they put me on antidepressants and things that just simply weren't working I found a holistic practitioner and long story short it ended up helping my body be able to absorb food this is one of the many benefits of a plant that's been illegal for a while so I started doing a lot of 
research. This was when I was 26, I'm 36 now. I wrote a book in 2019 um, about how it changed my life. But it didn't just change my life, I watched it change lots of moms and dads' lives, specifically with kids that had seizure problems. I've also watched it change a lot of veterans' lives with PTSD. I've seen people be able to have really functioning, healthy family lives using this plant. So as a result of that, I noticed that my state was considering to continue this nonsense. And so I'm, that pushed me really over the edge to run for governor. So to answer your first question, running for governor pushed me over the edge into this. And cannabis is something I'm passionate about because it saves people's lives. Okay. And that's a, that's a very hot topic, right? I mean, the legislative session, each legislative session, there's just lots of debate about bringing cannabis into Idaho. Idaho is one of the few states that has no forms of legalized cannabis, whether it's recreational marijuana, medicinal marijuana, or, or even CBD and stuff like that is very very controversial so uh, number one you know how do you gain because there's a lot of Idahoans that maybe don't support it in some in any form or in some form you know what what is your plan as governor to help push that into the state and you know do you anticipate getting the support of the of the citizens to do that as governor it's a great question I have met with a man that helps do the drug reform in 92 and 93 in this state. He's a, a well-known attorney downtown, and he's willing to do the drug reform again right now for this plant specifically. So I am drafting what would look like legislation to be able to start that process. In the meantime, when I'm elected governor in January, I would see that medically it was available in your hospital we would launch an educational campaign that was statewide and you would be able to decide at what level you wanted to participate as a citizen educationally for medicinal reasons and then as we progressed throughout the year uh, November would come and you would be able to vote in your county if you wanted it recreationally and so I would leave it up to the people at that point to govern themselves there's a demand for it medically and I'm tired of seeing doctors hands tied here frankly and not being able to provide citizens with choices that they deserve okay okay uh, let's shift into some of the some of the other issues what what are some of the other primary issues that you're other than cannabis that you're focused on in your campaign great question a lot of people are might say I'm a one you know, one candidate issue. Some people have labeled me as an activist, and frankly, that's completely false. I'm a extremely staunch Second Amendment supporter. In fact, my father is a firearms dealer, and since a child, I've been pushing primers and cleaning brass. I've shot every gun you can imagine, and I've reloaded almost every caliber. I'm very fluent with conservation and the hunting laws here, and what goes on with land rights, things like this. That's interesting. Uh, those things are things that I know a lot about something that's really pressing for the Idaho people is the housing crisis and as I've I have a TikTok right now and the biggest question and the biggest response I get is the housing issue and quite frankly we have a huge influx of out of state out of country money and we have to figure out how to regulate that in a way that works and we have to leave that up to the people to do it inside of their counties and in their communities but we have to figure out how to incentivize local landowners and local communities and citizens to work together and we have to build higher density housing in places that make sense so the housing crisis is first and foremost i think cannabis almost takes a back seat to that except we have a mental health crisis that almost overshadows all of it so the mental health crisis is something i've been <clears throat> very open about and it's not typically a very you know, a supported GOP issue. I'll put it that way. I see moms and dads calling me saying that they're living in their car with their children because they can't afford their rent. I have people, and part of this is they just need a place that they can go that's helpful. That's not the police, right? We've burdened our law enforcement with people crying out for help. And so mental health crisis would be number one, housing would be number two, and cannabis would be number three right now for me. Okay. So frankly, it's because it's a freedom issue, right? So our freedom. Okay, so what's the fix then on, let's, let's take the housing crisis because, you know, obviously housing prices in Idaho have gone up pretty much everywhere in the state. Uh, a lot of places, you know, maybe a new single family can't afford a home because of the skyrocketing prices. And that's largely driven by a, a huge population influx over the last 10 years. And that population continues to increase. So how do you, how do you solve the housing crisis here in Idaho? 
or potentially? Well, we start by having questions like that, right? We start by saying, who can you get together that has an effect on the housing market? So I was in Pocatello last week and I met with some people that they've been investing in this state for over 15 years. They're from I believe California, but what I know about them is that they suggested something to me that was really key. They said that anything that was built before 2020 should have an, a property tax ceiling, right? And so anything after that, the appreciation rate, as it grows, you'd be liable for that if it was built after 2020. And that is something that appealed to a lot of the people that were in the room. And so solving the idea comes from getting people together and figuring that out in your community, right? When you know that Farmer Joe lost his son and he doesn't have any option with all of his land. I've been out in Napa and Cuna, this is the situation and I see it. You come together as a community and you rally and you say, there's 60 people that need houses that live here with their families. How can we fix this and how can we accommodate this? And how do we have the government at this point because this is a crisis unfortunately mr little's pushed us into a crisis area and we have to do something dramatic to get out of it so that's one of the ways though is getting people together asking those kind of questions having the community directly involved and solving the issues day by day moment by moment instead of pushing it off pretending it's not happening okay uh, i want to go back just for a minute on on second amendment issues i mean every mm -hmm. I think every candidate in the state that is running, no matter which party they're running in or independent or whatever, is says they're very pro-Second Amendment and, you know, hey, I go out and shoot guns all the time. I go hunting. I do all of these things. Right. Uh, but I want to just ask about a couple specific issues so that citizens can get maybe more than just the, the usual <laughs> talking point, so to speak, that, that comes from all candidates. And so we try to ask them some more specific stuff, such as, you know, where do you stand on red flag laws? or universal background checks, for instance. Mm, so universal background checks in what specific regards? So there's, you know, like for instance, you, you and I, I could actually sell you a firearm. We don't mm -hmm. have to go down to a firearm dealer. I could just sell it to you if I wanted in Idaho. So a universal background check would say, no, you can't do that anymore. You Every, every firearm transaction that takes place has to go through a background check. Correct, and so that's just another knockdown of your freedom. At this point, we have the Second Amendment for a reason. We're going to uphold the Constitution, and that's, quite frankly, government overreach. Okay. And then what about red flag laws? That's Tell another me very specifically what you're... So a red flag law is, 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 this is kind of a big debate between the Second Amendment community and, and maybe those who want some more government intervention, but a red flag law is... You have a family member in some states, it could be a neighbor or a school counselor that says, hey, I, I think that you know, so-and-so is about to hurt themselves or maybe hurt other people. They haven't actually done it, but I'm concerned that they might. So they go to a judge and they, they have a meeting with the judge and the judge gives basically the police an order. They go to that person's home or wherever they're located and they confiscate their firearms and then say, okay, now you can come to court on this date and you can come tell us why, you know, you aren't what this person says you are at this time. That would be an extreme fringe on your freedom. <laughs> I mean, these are these are issues that quite frankly the radical left want to see blown up and made so huge and the people of Idaho know exactly where they stand on those issues. They're unwavering in their right to freedom and their ability to keep and bear arms and they will continue to be that way. Okay. All right. It's pretty kind of dry for me. I grew up with my, I mean, my dad builds long range rifles and he shoots. Um, and so I, I grew up with a very pro learning community. I learned from a little, as a child, right, how to handle a gun. I learned to teach my friends about safety, you know, about how to put the safety on and how to handle a gun. And so that's important okay. to me. And it, sure. Yeah, it's important to instill that in the next generation here. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the issue of abortion, you know, in Idaho. Uh, guns and abortion and hot topics maybe ed, you know an education we'll get education in a second but uh, where do you stand on the issue of abortion right now this is a freedom issue for me right now the current governor is using this issue to exploit citizens and pad his pocketbook those bills would never make it to the floor with me as governor this is 
about Except women. The heartbeat bill. I'm talking about the bills that have come up that are about how you could sue your Uber driver and on and on and on. This, this is just more of the bickering and more of the inside. It looks just like the bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. We are not proud of that here. I don't believe Idaho people are proud of that here. I believe they'll elect a candidate that is really grassroots from the people because of this. Uh, so I... It's interesting to talk about this, right? Because it brings up a lot of issues that people could be offended about. A woman deserves the right to take care of her body. We deserve to have that right here, just like we deserve to have the medical right of cannabis. To what degree is up to that woman and up to her medical care providers and up to her moral compass, not up to a government standard that's being, that's ex exploitative, ex exploiting people, right? That doesn't fit into my frame of reference. And so people have come at me really sideways about this on TikTok. It's interesting. They're like, you're so anti-abortion. And I'm like, no, I'm pro-freedom. I want you to have your choice. And I want you to see that this is a big charade, right? Let's take it off the table. There's other very Republican conservative states that don't even have it on the table because they know that they'll lose that because this is a freedom issue. So that's where I stand. Okay. So was, I'm, is that Tell me. like I'm, you're personally pro-life, but don't want the government intervening or I, I, so I, I, I believe I didn't that quite we deserve to own. take care of the women that are alive right now, that are breathing, and that are trying to make hard decisions. And I believe lawmakers are exploiting those women, making decisions that they have never had to do with anything. So whatever that looks like for that woman in that time of need, we will figure that out for her. And it's not my job to decide that right now in a sweeping change or a sweeping decision. They keep changing it every day over there to pad their pocketbooks. I'm okay. done. Yeah, I'm done having that on the table as something that's a, you know, partisan issue. Okay, that's no, a, I, did, a human I didn't. Rights I didn't issue. know as far as yeah. I mean, setting the woman part aside. I did. Where did you believe life begins? I guess that would be maybe somebody's next question on where does life begin for you personally? Man, that would be a personal choice. So for me, it really would depend on a case by case basis for that woman and how she felt about it. Okay. And no, so for like me, I know, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, the personal belief on it shouldn't matter as governor. My, my religious belief, my personal belief should not get in the way of someone's freedom. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right. I know. Um, and I don't, I'm not that, I'm not going to shy away from saying that that's the wrong or the right way to answer it. That's just the way that it deserves to be handled. It's a very sacred issue. It's not something to exploit. Okay. All right. Uh, let's switch over to education. And the, this is also another really big topic mm -hmm. in, in Idaho every single year during the session. And so let's first talk about education funding. And right now, you know, education does take up a large part of the budget. As governor, you know, do you think you would be pushing for more funding, less funding, or is the funding mm -hmm. good the way that it is? And do you also support that? Uh, I think Reclaim Idaho is doing a, a multi million dollar increase for education funding through a ballot initiative instead or do you think that might be the way to go i've seen their initiative they're taking action in their communities their strong initiative funding comes from money revenue comes from from dollars right so we have to increase the revenue into our state to have more funding and in my mind part of that revenue comes from cannabis if you look at the the tax money that's available through cannabis you can immediately put any percentage that you would like to, up to almost 100% of the full revenue back into the schooling systems immediately, back into the infrastructure for the schooling systems. And yeah, the, the, the topic of school choice, of the money following the child, that's really important right now. As I've traveled through the community, I see that there's rural communities that really need infrastructure and help that are losing population and gaining lots of things that they're not calm you know a lot of their kids are having problems with drugs right in these rural communities because they don't have any options for mental health so creating the awareness in the school and funding it based on new revenue is the most important part what they're going to do with that initiative we'll see okay. we'll see if that will work i'm not sure that will work and i will learn more about that with them but as governor i can clearly see that our funds need to be allocated to the appropriate school issues, not just teachers, you know, things that are out of the control of the parents. Okay. And so would funding need to be increased, do you think? One of the big, I guess, talking points is that Idaho 
you know, per pupil pays on, at the bottom as far as, how, you know, uh, the 50 states and how much is paid for education per pupil were towards the bottom of that. And so that's the argument. 3,700, 3,750, 5,600, increase that something amount like this. significantly. You know, do you think that's the case or is education fine the way that it is currently? No, 100%. We want to lead the pack in education. I grew up with amazing coaches and teachers. Preston High School was full of 10-year, 30-year coaches and teachers that led us into being amazing citizens. We would give back to our community. My class was incredible, right? The things that they did for the community. And we, we, were, we gleaned that from great leadership. And that's what we're begging for right now in Idaho. And I believe that will rise to the front and absolutely will increase the funding for our schools, for the pay for our teachers. And that comes with revenue increase. It doesn't just pop out of thin air, right? We can reallocate some funds and we can pass legislation, but we need new revenue in our state. And that's where we have to see that the 21st century requires immediate action. And I'm ready to take that. Okay. Um, what about the other, one of the other big issues that seems to pop up every summer and fall is the issue of fires. Lots of fires throughout the state. Uh, you're here in Southern Idaho, so you know the fire stuff, I mean, it's really just bad everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Either coming in from other states or our own forests are on fire. You know, what, what do you think you would do as governor, if anything, on, on the fire issue? Well, so we have, uh, we have a, a beetle problem, right? The beetle kill has unfortunately become excessive. And so we have to take extreme measure at this point to protect what we have got going on right so houses and things we probably have to clear places that we can have a burn area and we can systematically burn things that we know are going to burn and we know are going to cause us more problems in the future right being proactive is something that i feel like the current governor d doesn't do very well he likes to be in crisis right i want to be proactive so i want to take the opportunity to assess things fairly and to have people from all sides of the issue come and assess that if this were to burn, this would cause more damage. We're going to burn this now because we know the new regrowth is worth it. So you have to assess it from a ground level, and it's not a sweeping motion. It's a case-by-case -case scenario. Okay. Okay. Uh, what would you do as governor, if anything, on, on the health care issue? And maybe that will be one of our, our last topics. Um, you know, health care, the costs have increased. I think both sides seem to agree that health care is getting too expensive. The solutions, you know, vary very widely on how to bring the cost of health care down. What would you propose as governor to try and, and tackle that issue? Part of health care stems with, starts with mental health, and part of that relates to cannabis, right? There's a large portion of our state that suffers with mental health on top of something that they're dealing with. And so we have to dig to the bottom of the layer and say how do we help the people from the ground up we go into their society what is your greatest need right is it a mental health check in your society where people can go and get help is it funding your society or your town with more funds where do you need it right that comes from the people and the people are actually going to rise up and help themselves I feel like the current governor doesn't trust the people. I trust the people. I know that they have the answers and I'm willing to support them in those answers. So I can't give you the fix all. I wish I could, but that's just not a reality. And that's something that quite frankly, I get tired of. Before I was a politician, I wasn't always one. And I got tired of people having a Band-Aid and a fix-all, right? You have a broken leg spewing open, the Band-Aid's not gonna do well, right? We have to go in and we have to get a, a grasp on what's actually happening and we have to make decisions from what the people know that they need. Okay. Well, you're technically not a politician yet, right? Yeah, I know, right? Technically, <laughs> I'm elected. still Have you on been the elected side. office before? I have never been elected okay. to office before. But you helped Pedro get elected. I did help Is Pedro. That? I was yes. in that movie. Yes. So Point Dynamite. I saw that. <laughs> I see this. Yeah, it was still my freshman year of high school. Yeah. It came out my freshman year of college. What was that like? It was like out of a weird dream. Yeah. The people... Um, did you have any idea Jared it was going to be that big of a deal no. in the long run? And if I would have... I, would, I was in the sign language community, and so I would have been in the happy hands scene. I wish I would have done that, but I had volleyball practice because yeah. it was not that big of it. I mean, when we filmed it, it was like, come and be in a movie. And then uh, yeah. and then when we when it launched, it was something out of a, a dream, right? Yeah. And so I sold Vote for Pedro shirts in college and signed things and had fun with it and ended up getting an IMDb credit. And uh, okay. I, Where were you at in the movie? To, uh, the best part you can see me is when he tells her she has nice sleeves in the dance scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm right behind him with short blonde hair in a okay. purple dress. It's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But okay. yes, there's so many good 
things about that movie. It's yeah, very cliche to Idaho. <laughs> All right. Um, is there any other issues that we haven't covered right now that you're like, hey, you know what? This is also something I'm I'm running on and focused on that you wanted to talk about. I mean, I did, you didn't talk about freedom, but freedom is is what we're built on here. We're gritty, industrious salt of the earth people who work every single day for everything we have and for some reason we've allowed an elitist to lead us into this year and it we don't have to continue that that's something that you have the ability to change simply by going to vote on may 17th okay would that be a disagreement with how the covid situation was handled or just yeah. a lot of oh, things man. together? yeah it's a lot of things together the the fact that they won't but the fact of how they're handling this election says a lot. The fact that he's unwilling to debate, he calls himself non-debatable, that the people know what he's about. I don't think he's, I think he's in for a rude awakening on a lot of levels. And that's my personal opinion. I've seen it. I've been into the communities almost every single day, talking to people in every single aspect, and they're just ready for new leadership. Okay. So the last thing that we do is allow candidates to uh, do your campaign pitch. You can plug social media, website, all that kind of stuff, uh, whatever material you've got there. So you can talk to the camera and then we'll be good to go. Perfect. Well, if you want to learn more about me, you can go to ashleyforidaho.com and it will tell you everything you need to know. I also wrote a book. It's called Unstoppable. Feel free to get it. You got someone calling you. Do you That's think okay. it's good? No, you're good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that means it's time to go. I'm so grateful and so excited that you're here learning about me. He's a great interviewer. I appreciate your time. No, no problem. Did you did you plug your website? Yeah, ashleyforidaho.com, <laughs> F-O-R, Ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y. Okay, yeah. awesome. Well, thank you. Appreciate your time. You're very appreciate welcome. It.